The pulsometer is a miniature computer built into what looks like a watch. 126 beats per minute. Recording heart rate data via radio yeah, signals good. from the monitor in the rubber chest band. He's a little bit nervous maybe because he's not used to this. Just slow jogging. It's not a competition. The aim is to control exertion and ensure equality for all participants. When you run too fast or too slow, heart rate either increases or decreases and the wrist computer beeps. Using advanced mobile measuring equipment, almost all vital data can be collected during field training. A computer mounted on the runner's chest can record oxygen intake, heart rate changes, carbon dioxide exhalation, etc. Are you still feeling comfortable? The computer also has a powerful radio transmitter that sends the data to a base station located up to a kilometer away from the runner. Close to the right base. Here, the run can be transformed into easily comparable figures and graphs. Now we're getting oxygen uptake, and then we can get the ventilation as well. Very good, Feiner. These guys from Denmark enrolled us in this program, and we were given uh, shorts, running clothes anyway, kits, and then we started by training running three kilometers at a very easy pace first and then we increased our pace as we continued our training a little bit faster just a little bit og så udfyldte vi alle sammen nogle spørgeskemaer om vores fysiske aktivitet i barndommen og hvor meget vi laver nu og så videre jeg vil gerne vide hvordan jeres fysiske aktivitetsniveau er seks døgn i træk for at se, hvor meget I rører jer i løbet af dagen og aften i forhold til kenianerne. Physical activity outside of the training program is also measured. The participants sometimes have to wear the recording equipment even while sleeping. After 12 weeks, the time has come to compare the two groups' response to the training. We know exactly they have been training the same because we have control over the heart rate monitors. And they have been training both group. 99.9% .9 of the training has been conducted. So that is perfect. Okay. The exam consists of a 5,000 meter race in which each individual reveals his improved fitness level. Go! Come on, come on. Come on. All up in front. You should be the fastest one. Okay, 11 and a half rounds to go. The difference in running economy is so significant that despite sharing a similar maximum oxygen intake, the Kenyans still ran more than two minutes faster than the Danes. And this despite the fact that the Kenyans were running in thin air at an altitude of 2,000 meters, whilst the Danes were running at sea level. 22, 23, 24, 25. If you take the average times, the Kenyan were two minutes and 20 seconds faster than the Danish boys, even though they started with the same initial fitness level, and even though they trained and developed their uh, speed during training in the same, to the same extent, which means that uh, the trainability, the response to training is similar in the two groups. The Kenyans just start at a higher level because of the superior running economy. The difference in running economy is so significant that despite sharing a similar maximum oxygen intake, the Kenyans still ran more than two minutes faster than the Danes. And this despite the fact that the Kenyans were running in thin air at an altitude of 2,000 meters, whilst the Danes were running at sea level.
The mystery deepens. How come the Kenyans are so much quicker? The scientists had found no clues in the Kenyan environment or in the Kenyan's fitness level or training methods to explain this superior running economy. It must be, in our opinion, an inherited factor, which means that genetics is the major reason for the superior running economy of the Kenyan boys and probably also uh, of the Kenyan elite runners as well. The search for an answer now leads to a study of genetic traits. And they start with the muscle structure, trying to find something that will give the Kenyans an advantage. The muscles on the leg, uh, they, they are important. So we are very interested in uh, evaluating what the muscle looks like in regard to muscle fiber composition and the quality and also the machinery in the muscle where the oxygen is utilized. Det gør ikke sådan rigtig ondt, det er bare ubehag. Altså det er sådan et ubehag, ligesom at få mast en finger ind, og så er den bare inde i musklen i stedet for. By taking small samples of muscle tissue from both Kenyan as well as Danish runners, the scientists are able to compare the amount of different types of muscle fibers and enzymes. Ja, fint. Ja. Kan du holde det? Fint. In order to preserve all their properties for further studies, the muscle samples are immediately deep frozen in liquid nitrogen. One hypothesis that could explain the Kenyan capacity for endurance running is that the Kenyans have a greater number of so-called slow fibers in their muscle structure. It's okay? Yeah, it's okay. So will that not affect us? Any? No, the amount of muscle we take out, it's 100 or 200 milligrams. Okay. And the total muscle mass is around three kilos. In the Copenhagen lab, the muscle samples are taken out and prepared for a study under the microscope. The sample is being sliced in a high precision cutting machine. Every slice is thinner than a single hair. The slice is then dyed in order to visually separate the different muscle fibers. This is how the muscle biopsy would, would look if taken from a non-athlete. And as you can see, there is a number of slow fibers, the dark staining ones here. There's also a number of fast fibers, which are the white non-staining fibers but there's also a large number of gray fibers which are also fast these are very fast fibers okay so what you see here is a muscle biopsy from an extremely well-trained endurance athlete this person has an extreme amount of slow fibers compared to the amount of fast fibers here uh, he has more than 90 percent slow fibers which makes him very suitable for endurance type work. This particular biopsy is actually obtained from a Kenyan boy. And as we can see here, it's looks as any other biopsy and it has a fair distribution of uh, slow and and fast fibers and on average the Kenyan boys would have a fiber type composition that is very comparable to a uh, normal European boy of the same age. Since there were no clues in the muscle fiber composition the next step is to investigate whether the muscle enzymes differ. Certain enzymes play an important role in muscle performance. But this attempt fails as well. The diagrams show no difference at all. This is the one, you can feel it. Yes, yes. And then you stand as a soldier. Okay. Feet together. 
But there are also more obvious physical traits to compare. Whilst in Kenya, the scientists have the idea that maybe leg length has a role to play. And at last, they have found a clear difference. Despite the fact that Danish youths are on average five centimeters taller, measurements showed that the Kenyan youths had legs that were on average two centimeters longer. Through the use of a specially designed computer program, it's possible to study whether there is a statistical relationship between leg length and speed on the running track. The result is a graph that on the one axis shows energy cost and on the other leg length. The measurements are processed to establish whether there is a connection between the two. The figures at the bottom of the screen show the result, which is so low that it proves that there is no relationship. The research team is running out of ideas. Is this an unsolvable mystery? Five, okay. From the feeler camp. The time has come for more educated guesswork. For some time, Henrik Larsen had been thinking about something he had come across whilst working on another project. We knew from uh, other studies that if you place, for example, 50 grams of weight around the ankle, then you increase your oxygen consumption with 1%. So it's very expensive uh, to put on weight around the, the ankle. And we know uh, the more distally uh, the weight is placed on the leg, the more oxygen uh, cost uh, is uh, registered. So uh, therefore we started to compare the volume of the lower leg between the Kenyan and the Danish boys. Okay. With the help of a foot-shaped waterproof plastic box, they once again measure the legs of the two test groups. Please put your foot in, into the water. <coughs> Maybe a little bit cold, but... It's not taking long. 2.9. You're having the smallest foot volume for today, until now. You are number 12, we have been measuring. They continue with the elite runners, like marathon champion Jafet Kosge. Right foot. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and then the whole we measure the whole lower leg volume. Okay. Thank you very much. The amazing thing with this measurement is that Jacket has got really slender legs. You can see the mass of the lower leg is very low, which means that uh, he probably has got a very efficient running style, uh, very skilled running, and the fraction of the energy for moving the limbs is very low. Here, there is also an obvious difference between the Kenyans and the Danes. But how could the structure of the lower leg possibly be the key to the Kenyan running phenomenon? In Copenhagen, the water tank data is being processed and fed into the computers employing the same computer program used for the leg length study. And suddenly, a new, clear pattern appears on the screen. The most exciting physiological finding was that the good running economy uh, seemed to be due to the, the fact that the Kenyans had more slender legs compared to the Danish boys. And if you look at this graph, we can see that, that there is a relationship between the cross-sectional area of the lower leg and the oxygen consumption. Excitement grew amongst the researchers as the picture emerged. The Kenyan results are on the left of the graph, the Danish are on the right the probability that there is a clear relationship between leg thickness and running economy is overwhelming. The groups overlap each other in the middle. This means that Kenyan and Danish boys, having the same leg dimensions, also have the same talent for running. 
It was much simpler than we thought. It is all about the legs and the shape of the legs of these Kenyan runners. They are long and slender with very low mass. And that means that they have a good running economy. You need to have this structure, this form of legs. And that's not unique. You have a high concentration in this area, which we have been looking at. You might have other high concentration all the way in the world, where you not have the tradition for running and so on. So if you have the body shape among a Danish runner, or Scandinavian runner, then he will have the same possibility for run with such a good running economy. But you have to emphasize that training cannot influence the, the leg volume. You need to have it from the beginning. If I have to express this in a popular way, I'll say that you cannot, by training, change a donkey and make it a racehorse. You can make it a fast donkey. Uh, and I'm not saying uh, with this that uh, we have only got donkeys in Denmark, but there are definitely very few racehorses. Kenya today is a poor country with severe health and social problems. Here, a professional running career is the dream for many and a rescue for a few. Kenya's first gold medalist, Kip Kano, is also Kenya's most respected man. You find out how much you have received and how much you have paid out. His fame has enabled him and his wife Phyllis to establish a school and an orphanage on the outskirts of Eldoret. We started a children's home a long time ago and we have been having orphan children mainly uh, to provide them a shelter and where to, where to live, what to wear and uh, the most important part of it is education. When Kip Kano was at his peak, one didn't get rich from running, one became famous. He has used his fame to raise funds for the school and the orphanage. Well, in this world, we came to this world with nothing and we live with nothing. Mostly the kids I have, they are no father, no mother. And I feel that they need that uh, assistant to live like uh, they have parents. We have 86 at home at this moment, but we provide them the education, the need of today. And then when they are over 18, they belong to our society. And they can be able to live like any other family with their parents. So I'm the father, my wife is the mother. Some people would say, oh, it's a way out. It's not a way out at all. It's a way back in for the community because these people don't leave. I mean, some of these athletes that have, have gained success financially could, could possibly live in other parts of the world, but they choose to come back home. Kenya is their home. And when I come and, and back and forth, uh, or if I see the athletes in Europe or in the United States competing, Jim, when are you coming back home to Kenya? We miss you. And I miss them. And you miss Kenya. We shall be also in a position now to work extra hard. If we can tell the upcoming athletes, ABCD, this is what has been discovered, and we want to improve further, it will encourage them. It will very, very much encourage many, many of our athletes. Oh, my God. 